Hi there, everyone. Welcome back to Cody's Lab. So as you can see, I've got some fruit flies inside of a glass jar inside of a microwave oven. Now there's three reasons for that. First, I've been doing a bunch of canning lately. See some peaches here. And as such, the house is now completely full of these flies and I wouldn't be too upset to see a few of them get nuked. But the second reason is that in my last video, uh, in the mine, I took an infrared camera in and you could see through the smoke and dust using infrared light, whereas visible light could not go through it. Uh, visible light, the wavelength is about a thousand times shorter than the infrared light, and so the infrared light was able to go through the dust without being affected too much. Microwave radiation, which is also light, I've got a scale model of a microwave photon here, it's about 12 centimeters, or around a hundred thousand times larger than a wavelength of infrared light. So, you know, quite a lot larger than uh, visible light. Now, they're called microwaves, but it's only because uh, they're quite small when compared to, say, long wave radio. But anyway, the fruit flies, they are also about a hundred thousand times larger than the smoke and dust particles. So, the microwave radiation should affect them about the same as the infrared radiation affects smoke. And of course, the third reason I've chosen fruit flies for this is that, you know, they're a delicate living creature, and if the microwave radiation affects them, we'll know because they will die. Okay, so enough of that. Let's uh, set this up. Let's set a grape in here to compare. Because the microwaves, you know, the grape's much larger than the flies, so the microwave should interact with the grape. And to make this a bit more interesting, let's cut the grape a little bit so it's in two halves. Just like that. And now to make this, uh, you know, a valid test, we'll set another glass jar on top of the grape. Now, of course, microwave radiation, it goes through glass, is the same as it goes through air, basically. There's no interaction with the glass, but I know people will complain if I don't do that. Okay, let's pull the camera back a little bit. Let's set the microwave for about 30 seconds. Let's press start. Open the door, and we can see that the fruit flies are still alive. In fact, they are completely unharmed. The grape, however, is a sticky, very hot mess of fruit juice. So now I guess it's part of the video where I try to explain why the microwaves did not affect the uh, fruit flies here. So first of all, uh, this is not really an accurate model of a photon. You see, uh, light is electromagnetic radiation, which means you've got an electric field and a magnetic field, which is co-generated 90 degrees out of phase. So, and as you may know, when you have a magnetic field, which is changing, you generate an electric field. And that's how uh, photons are able to propagate. So you know, you know alternating electro, electric and magnetic fields. But uh, the electric field is what we're interested in here. Basically what this represents is plus 7,000 volts, negative 7,000 volts. Uh, that's about the voltage that this uh, microwave runs on. Actually it might be three and a half thousand, three and a half thousand, but you, you get the idea. So when this photon interacts with say the grape, so let's take the grape here, you can see the grape interacts with about, you know, about a quarter of the phase of this. So you've got from zero to around 3,000 volts that the grape is interacting with. So the potential difference across the grape is thousands of volts. So that's actually got an electric current going from one end of the grape to the other. That's uh, why you could see the uh, sparks and plasma generated between them. But now if you look at the fruit flies, which are only around one or two millimeters wide, you can see that, you know, they, they take up a very small amount of the actual, you know, phase here. 
you know, you might get several hundred fruit flies lined up end to end to equal the entire length of this here wave. And a thousandth of 7,000 volts is seven volts, which of course is not enough voltage to really do anything to flesh. That's not enough voltage to break down and cause the electrons to move. You know, maybe some will pass through, but it's not enough to hurt anything. I imagine if you set this for, say, five minutes, you might find the uh, fruit flies dying, but it probably would be because the metal of the microwave heating up and cooking them from the outside. Another way to describe this is that the fruit fly is only big enough to short out, say, one of these little batteries here. So, nine volts, that's not enough to hurt much of anything. But the grape was able to short out, well, hundreds of batteries. And so it generates quite a large amount of voltage, you know, 9 volts, 18 volts, 27 volts, etc. Well, actually, that's only partly accurate, because uh, microwaves will heat up things such as oil that don't conduct electricity very well. And uh, the reason for that is the microwaves also cause a dipole moment flipping thing that causes the uh, molecules to kind of vibrate faster and faster. But ultimately, the amplitude of those vibrations will depend on how much of the wave is intercepted. Is say as big as my hand, then the flipping is going to happen, you know, essentially most of the wave. But if it's only you know, really tiny, then the flip is going to be from here to here, which is not much of a change. So same thing really. Now if all goes well, some of you should be at wondering how I was able to film inside the microwave. Well, unlike other YouTubers, I'm going to show you. So as you can see here, I've got my iPhone just strapped to the side of the microwave. In order to see through, because you know these little holes are a little bit too small for the camera to actually get a good view, what I did was I literally just punched a hole in the side of the microwave here. Now I can get away with this because of another property of the electromagnetic radiation. See if I have a piece of metal, straight, looped, or flat, doesn't really matter. The magnetic portion of the uh, photon will come through and it'll create a magnetic difference which is changing rapidly inside the wire. That causes the electrons in the wire to be pushed along by the magnetic field, creating a, you know, a difference from one end to the other, and that'll create an electric current in the metal. The electron flowing through a wire, as you know, creates electricity. That forms an electric field. And as you know, when electricity is going through a coil of wire, it creates magnetism. So electricity going through the wire creates a magnetic field going around the wire. So that can be shown like this. So now your electric field in the wire creates a magnetic field, which in turn creates an electric field. And this whole thing is 90 degrees out, or exactly opposite of the original photon that went in. So when you've got a piece of metal, the microwaves will go in, to do and basically turn around and go out. They'll lose some energy if this is a resistive wire, but ultimately uh, microwaves reflect off of metal. Now there is one thing that I should mention that is uh, kind of misleading about my little model here, and that is that uh, these peaks, they really have nothing to do with the actual you know, size of the photon. You see, the electric and magnetic fields come off of this, go out to infinity. They just get weaker with distance, with the inverse square law. Now, you wouldn't expect a magnet here just to have a magnetic field stop at a certain distance, right? So anyway, if you have a piece of metal with a hole in it, and the photon goes through the center of the hole, and the hole is quite large, you know, then the uh, magnetic field will be rather weak at the edge of this metal. And so the electric field that is generated off of this will also be weak. And it won't be strong enough to interact with this one very much, and so the photon will go through, maybe a small amount, a you know, much, much smaller uh, amplitude wave will bounce off the edge of the hole, but ultimately the wave will just go right through it. But if your hole is uh, below a certain size, so let's, let's work that down, so with a microwave that works out to about three centimeters, then when this photon tries to go through here, 
it's going to create a magnetic field inside of this wire which creates your uh, counter wave which is as strong as the original wave and so it'll reflect off of this just the same as it would a solid piece of metal which of course means that these little holes that are in the side of the microwave here are way smaller than they need to be I mean it makes sense you know, if you're an engineer designing this thing you'd uh, want to say the worst case scenario like if you had the hole exactly the right size you know you know, maybe somebody could hit it with something and it'll cause it to deform and now radiation is getting out. So you make the holes a tenth as big as they need to be to have total safety. And I can respect that. But it means if I need to say a larger hole to get the camera view in, I can go ahead and punch one as long as I keep it smaller than around three centimeters wide. As far as the microwaves are concerned, I have not changed anything. One definite thing that you should keep in mind though is all these sharp edges from the cut need to be on the outside. Otherwise, they could cause uh, you know, points where the microwaves could interact with. You might see some arcing if you didn't do that. So, you know, use caution and probably don't try this at home. But if you don't believe me that you can do this, well, just look in the bottom of the microwave here where this little turntable fits in. And look at this. You've got about a one centimeter wide hole right there, which is about the same size as the hole that I put there. Obviously this hole is safe, otherwise these things would never sell. If microwave manufacturers were serious about saving money on the uh, metal, they could go and make the front screen, and potentially the rest of the box, out of, uh, say, quarter-inch hardware cloth. As far as the microwaves are concerned, this hardware cloth is equivalent to a solid sheet of metal. But of course, visible light, which has a wavelength on the scale of nanometers, which is literally too small for me to show because it has to be bigger than that for the visible light to interact with it, would for the most part just go right through the mesh and the mesh would obstruct the view very little. So there you have it. The reason why the microwaves don't interact with the glass is because the glass doesn't have uh, free electrons that can move around and conduct electricity, at least as long as the glass is solid like this. Uh, liquid glass uh, conducts electricity and heats up in a microwave just fine. And also, you've learned that the fruit flies are too small to interact and absorb the microwaves. If you had a microwave oven that uh, produced uh, microwaves in a higher frequency, so instead of uh, 2.4 gigahertz, perhaps 100 gigahertz, you know, that'd make the wave you know, much sharper, then maybe the uh, fruit flies would have a bit more of an issue. This, of course, means that when you've got radio waves, uh, such as what is used in communication and radar, those waves are way bigger. They go from like the size of your house to several miles wide. In that case, the radio waves are going to affect you the same way that the microwaves affected the fruit flies. I'm sure people with advanced degrees in uh, electrodynamics will complain about all the things I left out or got wrong, but I don't claim to be an expert. I hope you enjoyed, and I'll see you next time. There you go. Have at it. <laughs>